Good evening, and welcome to the first edition of CBS Live Presentations. Tonight, CBS News 50 Years Later, The Beatles at the Ed Sullivan Theater. Presented by Motown the Musical. This evening show is streaming worldwide. Please feel free to tweet, pin, tag, and have a great time. It's happening live, 50 years from where it all began. The Ed Sullivan Theater in New York City. There's only one show with enough energy to lift you out of your seat and into music history. Motown, the musical. It's more than a Broadway show. It's a celebration of music that transformed America. Get your tickets at MotownTheMusical.com. Watch me now. Do you have any fears that your public eventually will get tired of you and move on to a new favorite? Mm. Well, they probably will, but you know. Do you ever think about it? Depends that? how long it takes for them to get tired. teenagers once helped repulse the British at Bunker Hill. The British invasion this time goes by the code name Beatlemania. D-Day has been common knowledge for months and this was the day. The invasion took place at New York's Kennedy International Airport. They're great. I think they're born. What's a woman's opinion of the Beatles? A young woman's opinion that is. I think they're sharp. Why do you like the Beatles? I know. They're taking money out of America and bringing it over to England, and we need money here. Are you here to protest then? Yes, I am. came up with the name Beatles and what does it really mean? John thought of the name Beatles and he'll tell you about it now. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it, does, it means Beatles, doesn't it? You know, it, that's just a name, it, you know, like shoe. Imagine the, shoe. the shoes. You yeah. see, we could have been called the shoes for all you know. An epidemic called Beatlemania has seized the teenage population, especially female. <laughs> Some say the Beatles represent authentic British youth, self-confident, natural, direct, decent, vital, throbbing. George, you've got sexy eyelashes. Who has? George, you've got sexy eyelashes. Which one is George? That one. That one. You've got sexy eyelashes. Wherever the Beatles go, they are pursued by hordes of screaming, swinging juveniles. Have you ever been this crazy about any other entertainer? No. And that's what's so amazing. We don't know why we're like this. Thousands of teenagers in every city and town stand in line all night to get tickets for their touring show. Girls faint when the tickets run out. We came here at 6 o'clock in the morning, 5 30 to see them, and all they do is push your father and father away, and then they don't even let you see them. You've been here since 6? They symbolize the 20th century non-hero as they make non-music, wear non-haircuts, give non-mercy. I don't care what anybody thinks. I love the Beatles for them, and I'll always love them. Even when I'm 105 year old grandmother, I love them. And Paul McCartney, if you are listening, Adrian from Brooklyn loves you with all her heart. I love you, Paul, and please come to the window so I can just see you. But I love you, and I want you, Paul. Please look at her. And Ringo, you can look at it too, because I like you. Ladies and gentlemen, the Beatles! <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome our host, CBS News correspondent, Anthony Mason. Hello, everybody. How great is it to be in this theater tonight? How great is it to be here? 50 years to the night. 
at the Ed Sullivan Theater. We got radio contest winners here. Where are you? Thank you for being here. Ed Sullivan broadcast out of this theater, the Studio 50 it was called then, for 23 years. He had some amazing acts who played on this stage. Elvis, The Doors, The Supremes, The Jackson Five. But even he was amazed at the frenzy that accompanied what he called those four youngsters from Liverpool. 50,000 people applied for tickets to be here in this room 50 years ago this night. There were 728 seats. You had better odds of getting into Harvard. <laughs> 73 million people would watch this broadcast, and within two months, the Beatles had the top five songs in America, a feat to this day that has never been equaled. The billboard estimated that in the first three months of 1964, 60% of all the records sold in America were Beatles records. We're going to have a lot of fun tonight. We have some really great people who have played with the Beatles, who know the Beatles, who've been influenced by the Beatles. We even have one woman who married a Beatle. <laughs> but first, I want to do what Ed Sullivan would have done in his broadcast on this night, which is to point out a couple of distinguished guests we have here. And first are two of Ed Sullivan's granddaughters. Margot and Carla Precht are here with their family. Will you guys stand up for us? As your granddad would say, take a bow. And 50 years ago, at exactly this hour backstage, the Beatles would have been getting made up. And the makeup artist was a woman named Ricky Johnson, who'd already worked for CBS for about 10 years. She still works for CBS. She's been here 61 years. Ricky Johnson is a CBS institution. Ricky, where are you? She's here tonight. Ricky, stand up, take a bow. She works for CBS Sunday morning. Now to our distinguished guests here tonight. Peter Asher is one of music's most acclaimed producers, James Taylor, Linda Ronstadt, many others. But in 1964, he was one half of the hit duo Peter and Gordon. And his sister, Jane, was dating Paul McCartney, who moved into their house and into the room right next door to Peter's. <laughs> Patty Boyd was one of the most photographed models in swinging 60s London. But in 1964, she got a call to show up at a train station for a bit part in a movie called The Hard Day's Night. Not long after that, she was Mrs. George Harrison. Mick Jones is, of course, the founder of the great rock and roll group, Foreigner. But in 1964, he was a guitarist working in France playing for a French pop singer named Sylvie Vartan. And he got a gig for more than two weeks playing alongside the Beatles in Paris right before they came to the United States. So please welcome our first three guests, Peter Asher, Patty Boyd, and Mick Jones. Thank you, sir. Have a seat right there. Hello, my dear. You look fab. You're the third down. Peter's yeah. there. Okay. Peter, let me start with you, because okay. this whole idea of Paul McCartney sleeping in the room next to you is, is fascinating to me. <laughs> you, he literally stored his instruments in your room. You were up in the attic together? and the, while... the, the, uh, the guest room was on the top floor of the house next to my bedroom, yes. Right. So, when the, our parents kind of took pity on him because he was hanging around the house a lot yep. and offered him the guest room, yes, when they weren't out on the road, he, that's why he was living as a sort of pied -a in London. Now, I know there's a story about a song that, that he came and said he wanted to play for you that was, ended up being the, the first hit here in the United States for them. That's true. Um, that was a fortunate moment. The, my, my mother was oboe professor at the Royal Academy of Music up the road and taught the oboe. Uh, but she also had a small music room in the basement where she gave private lessons when she wasn't teaching at the academy. And it had just a small upright piano in it and a music stand and a piano bench and a little sofa. And uh, quite early after he'd, he'd come and deliver this for a while, Paul was uh, down there and John came over and they went down together to write for I think only an hour or so when Paul called up the stairs and asked me if I wanted to hear the song they just finished, which I was happy to do. So I went and sat on this little sofa and they sat side by side, interestingly, on the piano bench. There were no guitars in the room. Right. And played uh, I Want to Hold Your Hand for the first time anywhere and asked me what I thought. And what did you say? I said I thought it was very good. Um, <laughs> it's, <laughs> no, it's really hard to know. I mean, one doesn't like to be pretentious about it. It is only a pop song, but there is something magical about the moment of creation of 
of something that extraordinarily good. You think, you know, am I going a bit crazy or is it about the best song I've ever heard in my life? Mm -hmm. Or possibly both. And I know my reaction actually was to ask them to play it again, uh -huh. which is of course the sign of a great pop record. As teenagers, we would endlessly, as soon as the record's finished, you put it back to the beginning. Right. And that was my reaction. Oh God, it's good, can I, play, you know, can I hear it again? That of course was the record that really broke them here in the United States. It spent seven weeks at Well, it was one. because Capitol finally woke up and started putting their records out. Right. I mean, they'd made some really good records before that, which mm -hmm. had been hits in England, but America wasn't yet paying attention. Mm -hmm. Mick, I want to go to you because, because right before the Beatles came here, they were in Paris and uh, for th almost three weeks, and you were on the same bill with them. Yeah. Well, how were they re being received in Paris at that time? Well, um, I think in, in, in France, it took a little longer for the French to fall under the spell, you know. Mm -hmm. and, um, but nevertheless, the shows in Paris were all sold out. I mean, it was... Uh, there was a tr guy called Trini Lopez. Trini Lopez was your opening uh, act. If I had a hammer, and uh, he was the opening act, and uh, he was a big, you know, he had a couple of big hits, so... But uh, then I would go on with the band I was in, with Sylvia Vartan, and, uh, you know, we would do uh, about uh, 45 minutes, as one did those days. And then the Beatles, the curtain would come down, the Beatles would come up <laughs> behind the curtain, carrying their own equipment. This was before roadies, you know, mm -hmm. things like that. So they literally came on the stage with one guy and, and their amps, and that That's was it. it. Yeah. And how yeah. did they sound? Oh, they sounded unbelievably just tight and perfect, you know, the, the, the sound was just almost like the records, you know. And in those days, that wasn't easy to, to, to recreate, you they know. They were with a really good live band. I mean, they'd, yeah. they'd had a lot of practice. They'd yeah, in Hamburg those, and all those places, exactly. yeah. Yeah, they were great. And what did you think when you heard them, Mick? I was just dazzled, you know. I, I stood on the side of the stage, and uh, the first night I saw them, it was like, a, a sort of white light experience, you know. <laughs> they were so, per as, as Peter said, they were so perfect. Uh, they were so mad, there was like an aura around them. They were, you know, they played for a full 40 Ooh. minutes, mm -hmm. you know, which was, but they played 15 songs in that time. Wow. And uh, yeah, I wish I could get away with that. You know? <laughs> <laughs> Did they have any sense of, of were they talking about going to America at that point at all in, in, oh, in yeah. anticipation and, and so forth? Yeah, it was a lot of anticipation. Um, because I have to say, I mean, they were so influenced by American music. Uh, right back, you know, I, I kind of look at it as the Elvis Presley era sort of opened the door and then really the, the Beatles came and just crashed through it and just moved us on to, and you know, through a kind of a revolution in music. Mm -hmm. But America was the dream. I mean, they were essentially a tribute band to American music. Right. You know, we all loved American music, and you essentially so, brought our music back to us in exactly. a way. Exactly. The going to America was the ultimate dream. Mm -hmm. I mean, one forgets that back then it wasn't easy to go. Right. It was expensive. It was a really long way. People didn't go for a week in Florida as a holiday the way and they there, do now. And there hadn't really and, been any successful British bands here, had there? No. I mean, a couple of hits. Lonnie Donegan had a hit, Aka Bilk had a hit, Ralph Harris had a hit, but they were kind of one-offs. America never really bought into our artists. Mm -hmm. And in this particular case, so the, the, the exciting thing about for the Beatles and for all of us about success in America was that it meant you got to go there. None of us had ever been there. It was a, a magical land that we knew from movies and television and great music. Mm -hmm. Patty, the Beatles come to New York. As soon as, almost as soon as they get back to England, they're starting work on a new film. And you get a call from your agent to show up. And, and what happened? Well, in, initially, I'd gone for an interview for this film part, but without realizing, I thought it was um, a, a, an interview for a TV commercial, because uh -huh. I recognized the director who I'd worked with before. And um, later on that day, my agent phoned to say, I got a part in the Beatles film. I couldn't believe it. This was <laughs> extraordinary. How did this happen? <clears throat> and and I, I panicked and said, I, I never had any desire to be an actress. Mm -hmm. And they said, don't worry, you only have to say one word. Prisoners. Prisoners, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> so I thought I could do that. But the annoying thing is, I thought annoying, was that here I am <laughs> going to meet these fabulously um, exciting new band wearing a school uniform. 
I thought this was the worst. I'm sure that went down very well. <laughs> <laughs> I you look pretty good that. in that school uniform, yeah, Patty. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> I'm looking at it right up there. <laughs> it, it was received rather well, I think. When did you notice uh, that George was paying uh, a certain amount of attention to you? Well, you know when somebody's got their eye on you. You can sort of <laughs> sense it. Mm -hmm. you know? So it was quite exciting. And anyway, we sat next to each other at lunch. And we started talking and... What did you talk about? You think I can remember? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I might remember that conversation. Um, I don't know. Maybe he was telling me about whatever. I don't know. <laughs> America. He, 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 did, he did actually ask you to marry him that day, didn't he? He did. But, I mean, because they were... <laughs> they were so funny all the time. Playful, yeah. Playful. And you never really knew whether they were taking anything seriously. Mm -hmm. So in the middle of a conversation, he said, oh, will you marry me? I thought, this is part of his sort of joke. Yeah. So what, I ignored it. What was, what was the whole atmosphere around him, around them, like at that it time? It was, um, it was high energy and electric and um, fascinating because they were, they sparked off each other very quickly and they're very fast, very amusing, very witty. And it was wonderful to be in their presence. Peter, the, the, one of the most striking things about, the, about all four of them was just the constant creativity. I yes. mean, you talk about what you experienced just in your house. I mean, it was in your house that Paul ended up writing yesterday. Yes. Uh, in the bedroom right next to you, he rolled out of bed and started putting the melody down, right? Yes, I wasn't there actually that day. I think he played it to my mother first because he was convinced that it was the song that already existed. He was playing to people going, what is this? I know this melody, what is it? Right. And finally, when no one knew what it was, it dawned on him that he'd invented it. But, <laughs> it, but it, it actually, apparently, he didn't sit down consciously to write it. He woke up with that one fully formed in his head, wow. which is one of the mysteries of being a, a brilliant composer, which he is. W was, were they writing songs constantly while you were there? Uh, yes, not that often together. Mm -hmm. My Von Holdjam was an exception in that regard, but Paul was all the time playing and singing and frequently writing, yes. Mm -hmm. And you were, you were, your career was, you know, was taking off at that time too. You'd actually play on this stage in, in November of 1964 with Peter and Gordon. I wasn't sure of the date, but yes, we certainly played here. Yeah. Um, yes. And, and, and a, it was a Paul McCartney song that really kind of kicked things off for you, wasn't it? Yes, but interestingly, not the one that we played here. Right. For, for, for a, I'll tell you very briefly, the reason was that, you know, this was, World Without Love was an unfinished song that I'd heard that Paul had written that John didn't think the Beatles should do. He thought the first line was laughable, apparently. I've read mm -hmm. since. Please lock when, me away. Please lock me away. John would go, OK, the song's over. <laughs> and and, uh, and <coughs> so he was sitting there finished, unfinished with no bridge. Mm -hmm. Later on, Gordon and I got a record deal. I went back to Paul and said, if that song's still floating around, can we do it? He said, yes. And we did it. And it, of course, went to number one all over the place and changed my life forever, for which I'm very grateful. But when we came to America, we discovered Bobby Rydell had covered it the huh. instant that, that our record had come out wow. and had done it on Ed Sullivan. Wow. So that we couldn't, that first trip, we didn't do Ed Sullivan because Bobby Rydell had pipped us to the post. But, um, <laughs> but so we did, we actually did a later song on Ed Sullivan, which was very exciting. And Sullivan show was great because it was live. Right. And the most fun shows were the ones that weren't lip sync but were live. And in our case, we did it with the Ed Sullivan Orchestra, who were really good. Mm -hmm. And as Mick said, back then, sound generally was really primitive. There were no monitors or anything. Mm -hmm. But when you watch the Sullivan show, it still sounds remarkably good. Yeah, it does. They did a great job. Mick, I, I was out talking to Ringo, actually, a week ago when they were making the special. Yeah. And I'd asked him, I, the Beatles went, their first real gig in the United States was, was in Washington after they played the Ed Sullivan show. Yeah. And, and the crowd was kind of crazy and the place was, was, it was, it was a, an odd setup, but they had to move around like constantly to play to each side of the audience. Really? And I said, was that the craziest, were the American crowds the craziest? And he said, no, actually the craziest were in Paris because the audience that came out had a lot of guys in it who were coming to see Sylvie Vartan, your yeah. singer, and, and they all had sort of a guttural roar to them. Yeah. What did it sound like there? What did they sound like? Well, well what did the whole atmosphere sound like? Oh, you mean the whole atmosphere? Like? Um, well, I heard a lot of screaming, <laughs> you know. <laughs> the thing, one night, I left the theater with them, and uh, it was almost like a scene out of A Hard Day's Night, running with, with them <laughs> into the big mother's, we used to call them mother's pride cars, the big English limos, and uh, they had them brought over to Paris. And um, just that, you know, the screaming, the pitch, 
was crazy. And, uh, you know, it was just that bundling into the car, shooting off with the police escort. And, you know, I'd never, I was 19. I, it was like, wow. One day, one day I'm going to try and get something like this happening. <laughs> and, and, you did. and very well, too. And, well, I think I have to thank the Beatles for showing me the way. We, you know? we all do. I do remember when they got back from Paris, the thing they were most excited about was that they'd got to meet Bridget Bardo. Right. Which I would have been, which I would have been equally excited about. That was really high on their agenda from what I've heard. She was, she was it. You, I've, I've heard, <laughs> I I've met heard her too. you say. <laughs> yeah. You met her too? Yeah. Oh yeah. I still believe our town wasn't so bad. I, I she wasn't bad at all. She still is. Very nice. <laughs> <laughs> um, Peter, I've heard you say that the, that the, the British invasion was 90% Beatles and 10% everybody else. I think that's true. I mean, in the end, of course, a lot, a lot of very good bands enjoyed a lot of success, and I'm not in any way denigrating the contribution of brilliant bands like the Kinks and the Zombies and all kinds of other bands. Mm -hmm. But the impact, what made the difference, was the Beatles. In other words, we owe it all to the Beatles. They opened the door and the rest of us followed them through, you know, meekly and joyfully. But uh, it, was, it was a Beatles revolution. Patty, do you think they had a sense of how much influence they were having in music and how much they were changing music? Or was that something they even thought about? I don't think they really thought about it. I think they were just um, very happy with getting number one hits in the charts mm -hmm. and um, being invited to America again and invited to do um, tours all over the world. They loved all that. But I don't think they consciously realised what an influence they were. Mm -hmm. They became pretty much the centre of London, didn't they? And you... as along with them. Mm. What was that like? Busy. <laughs> <laughs> it was, uh, it was uh, yes. We James. To, yeah, we went to so many clubs. And what was fantastic and fun was that if one of them wanted to go somewhere or do something, mm -hmm. then we'd all do it. Mm -hmm. So we were a sort of a gang. Mm -hmm. and, um, and how did they deal with, with all the attention? I mean, how did you outrun all that? Well, it was fine once you got into the club because there are normally other musicians, you know. Mm -hmm. Stones would be there or other bands would be there, so that was fine. But it became pretty burdensome pretty quickly, didn't it? Yes, it did. Once everybody, well, a lot of the fans found out where they were living in London, mm -hmm. they'd camp outside their doors and just wait for them to come out. So they were virtually trapped in the same way that they were trapped when they'd go on tour to some exotic country um, and they couldn't come, go out of the hotel, <clears throat> couldn't leave because there'd be too many fans. So wherever they were, even at home, they were trapped. So this was the price to pay. Right. I love the story, Peter, that I think, I think in your house even, uh, your father had to devise a way out the back for Paul to get, to get out of the house? It's true, yes. He, he'd, my father invented a way out, out over the rooftop or something, uh, mm -hmm. some particular day. But it was odd anyway, because my father saw patients in that house, you know, so, so patients would be coming to see this distinguished physician and wondering what all these girls were doing on the doorstep. Right. <laughs> and they were out there all the time, right? They were out there all the time. Right. It, well, it must have been very puzzling. <laughs> <laughs> so he could actually crawl out across the roof through a no, neighbor's, I think, right? He went right? through a neighbor's house across the roof to the house next door, yes, <laughs> to get Paul out. Were they writing constantly? Uh, I think so. I don't know, really. I mean, writing is a private process. So I never sat in the room while Paul was writing a song, I don't think, in my life. Mm -hmm. um, so we, but, but he's one of those people, as, as was John, where the creative process is continually ongoing. Yeah. So even when someone... Is, driving somewhere they can be writing a song yeah. so you don't really know I mean a lot of writers think of their best ideas while doing something else you know doing doing the ironing or whatever mm -hmm. you can invent a song at the same time and they people do right and I'm sure they did because the certainly the output proves that I mean the number of records great records they made in that short relatively short period of time was stunning but at that time of course it wasn't surprising I mean mm -hmm. they're all their heroes like Buddy Holly wrote an amazing catalog of songs in, what, a year and a half or something, yeah. and then died. Mm -hmm. so, so they were just doing what, the way they thought it was done. You make records fast, you write songs fast, and they were just better at it than anybody else had ever been. Mick, how much influence did you think they had on you musically? Well, as Peter was saying, you know, uh, I think everybody in my, at that, that time, had been Ooh. highly affected by a bunch of American rock and rollers like uh, Buddy Holly had a huge effect on England, uh, Eddie Cochran, um, Gene Vincent, and exactly. these heroes, for us, they were heroes because they weren't getting 
the full you know, extent of uh, appreciation in America necessarily, but they'd come over to England and we embraced them. We used to think, to be honest, that we maybe understood American music, particularly American <coughs> rhythm and blues, and appreciated it a little more than America did. We mm -hmm. thought America took it for granted, you know? Mm -hmm. And when we noticed, for example, that you know, the version of Tutti Frutti in England that was a hit was Little Richard. Right. And we looked across the Atlantic and you had Pat Boone at number one. <laughs> we, we, we'll try we, to forget that, sorry. We, we, knew, <laughs> we knew we were right. Yeah. <laughs> it is pretty funny, you, as I said, that you ended up bringing, essentially bringing our music so back it, to us. I mean, rock and roll was considered all but dead until the Beatles came back. It's one of the all-time great con acts of all time. <laughs> we, we copied your music, did it differently, and sold it back. <laughs> <laughs> but they were, they were heavily influenced by, which I was surprised, by uh, R&B of that period. Yes. Uh, especially, I remember they were constantly playing uh, Marvin Gaye mm. music, you know, from Can I Get a Witness on around that era, era of time. Um, and of course they recorded, you really got a hold recorded, on me. And yes. all, all of which a lot of people Mookie didn't Robinson. know. Yeah. Money, Barrett right. Strong, you know, a lot of Americans only heard those songs for the first time by the Beatles. Mm -hmm. and didn't know that they were, you know, that they were actually American and had them all along. All right. Peter Asher, Patty Boyd, Mick Jones, thank you all very much. We're gonna, thank you. We're, we're gonna. Thank you. We want to look at sort of the wider influence of the Beatles and of course beyond, uh, beyond music, the Beatles explored the visual. They made five films. Uh, and hu humor was an early trademark, particularly in A Hard Day's Night. Um, so we're going to bring out two guests to talk about that, the, the sort of broader influence of the Beatles. Julie Tamor is an acclaimed theater and film director. And she also wrote and directed Across the Universe, a 60s love story built around Beatles music. And she had her own love affair with the Beatles that started on February 9th, 1964. Neil Innes is one of uh, a, a musical and comedic force, really. Uh, he's behind the Ruddles, one of the forces behind the Ruddles, the 70s band that brilliantly parodied the Beatles, of course, in music and mockumentary, uh, including the film All You Need Is Cash, uh, in which George Harrison had a small part. So please welcome Julie Taymor and Neil Innes. Hi, Julie. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you, too. Hey, Neil. Uh, Julie, let me start with you, because I know February 9th, 1964 actually inspired a, a work of art out of you. What happened exactly? I watched the show, the Ed Sullivan show, mm -hmm. so I... Were you, were, you, were you a big fan already? I can't remember. Yeah. <laughs> no. I think I was. You know, my sister, my older sister played all the music and I would, I would hear it, but I think I started to be a fan, an 11-year-old fan at that time. 11 yeah. years old. Yeah. And you actually did a couple of drawings? I did. What were you, what, what, do you remember what you drew? Well, I think I drew from the point of view of the Beatles. I think I was behind one of their heads, and I drew this theater, and I've never been in this theater till today. Uh -huh. So I actually... There it is. <laughs> oh, no, that's not the... That's, that's the party dancing. The other one is the actual... Ed, that one. There you are. <laughs> <laughs> I like the girl with her head on the, on the floor there. I think there were a couple the of girls here like that that night. <laughs> And I think that one there with the bangs and the bow is a self-portrait, partly. Is a self-portrait? <laughs> the tears, too. The tears. Oh, I don't think so. I think that was uh, made-up tears. But <laughs> obviously, it, it was just so thrilling and exciting to see not just the performance of the performers, but the audience. Mm -hmm. The audience. The reaction of the audience. That was, that was uh, historical as well. Yeah, just amazing. It, 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 it was. It told you something really big was happening, yeah. I think. Neil, how, how were you first exposed to the Beatles? I don't like the sound of that. <laughs> uh, they, they, I, I was, <laughs> um, I was in a band called the Bonzo Dog Doodle yeah. Dog Band, and um, thank you. But um, and because we 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 knew Paul's brother Michael. Mm -hmm. He was in the band called The Scaffold. And, and it, one thing led to another. The next thing we get a call, would we be in this movie they were making called Magical Mystery Tour? Right. So, yeah, we, we went along and did that. We weren't on the bus, but we were in the, uh, in the strip club doing the, uh, the censored bit. So you were exposed. 
I suppose we were exposed. You wrote the you wrote the song "Death Cab for Cutie," correct? Which inspired that's the name right. of an indie rock band. That's, that's still... right. I know. And I, I got the I got the idea for the song from a, an American magazine. It's got a true crime magazine, mm -hmm. and the headline, you know, very lurid cover. One of them said "Death Cab for Cutie," and the other one, which we also made into a song, but it, it, it didn't. Um, quite have the same thing, it was called It Was a Great Party Until Somebody Found a Hammer. <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean, that's what we were like, you know, we've got to have that. <laughs> <laughs> well, talk about, I mean, one of the things I think that struck Americans so much about the Beatles when they arrived, it wasn't, I mean, the music was obviously very powerful, but it, there, were, there was something in their personalities. I mean, humor was such a part of they their were, whole appeal. They were funny guys, you know, I mean, in, in all, the, all, the, all the sort of stuff you know, in the press conferences, you know, it's, it's natural. And I think you get that from all the hard work they did in the clubs, you know, mm -hmm. living in the same room in the rat keller, you know. It, it's, uh, you, you get a bond, you know, and then you almost know where you, what somebody's going to say and you bounce off it. It's a bit like improvisation. Yeah. They were doing, you know, in those days. Mm -hmm. Which came from them being so comfortable with yeah, each other. I think there's, and they did things on British television where they did a, I remember seeing them do a scene from Mid, Midsummer Night's Dream. Yes. When, and, and Ringo was sort of like, I am wall, you know. <laughs> and was, I remember that well, it was great. That's where we got it from. I just did that, and we had this. <laughs> <laughs> Didn't know we stole it from Ringo. Julie, you ended up you ended up making a movie with Beatles music. I know T Bone Burnett was involved in that, and I, I, once in a conversation with him, he was using a Beatles song for another movie, and he said covering a Beatles song is is one of the hardest things to do. He mm -hmm. said you think it would be easy, but they're they're so distinguished that that it's extremely difficult to actually cover them. Well. Elliot Goldenthal, who, who did a great deal of the arrangements for that for Across the Universe, said it like this, that if you're one chromosome away from the original yeah. in the arrangement and the singing, it's deathly. It's yeah. terrible. Really, if you're going to do it, you have to change the arrangement. So, because the Beatles themselves, their arrangements, their performance is perfect. But to do, they're such great, the individuals, the composer and lyricists, as lyricists and composers, John, Paul, George in particular, they're, and Ringo as well in one, one song, but they're such great composers that other people can cover those, those songs and make it their own. Mm -hmm. There are a lot of bands, there are a lot of songs from bands where you don't like it when you don't hear the original. You, know, you don't like it as yeah. much. You can't get the original performers version out of your head, but the Beatles are so, the Beatles, George, George, those composers are so brilliant that an Aretha Franklin version of Let It Be is very different than Paul's. And all of these other great, great songs are, are so well done in other mouths. So I think, you know, as far as T-Bone and Elliot and, and um, uh, T. Skoll, who worked on those, it was very tough. It was very, very difficult for them. But I think it worked well, especially when you put it into female mouths, you know, when you had, yeah. because the, um, those early songs were channeling 15 year old girls. Mm -hmm. They were channeling those girls. Did to they have do it a, well? Uh, well, I'm saying the, the, of course they did. That's why the <laughs> girls went crazy for them because these songs, uh, if I fell in love with you, it, they're, they're really hard to even imagine men singing some of these songs now. Mm -hmm. How, Neil, the the the, um, the Ruddles started as sort of a one-off skit. Yeah. How did it expand beyond that? Well, it, it, because I think at the time uh, they were talking about giving the offering the Beatles twenty million dollars each to get back together again. Right. Um, <laughs> it, was a, it was getting silly, you know. And Lorne Michaels down the road and the that other network. Um, <laughs> You know, they were running gags about it, yeah. you know, and they had George on there and was waving $3,000 under his nose because that was the musician's union rate for four guys. <laughs> I said, just get the guys back together, you know. Yeah. And he said, what, all of this for me? And, you know, and he said, no, 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 you have to share it between you. Don't, maybe you don't have to tell Ringo. They were doing jokes like that. <laughs> and, uh, but he said, something, it was getting silly, so something sillier needed to be done. And, and Eric and I had already made this kind of one-off. This is Eric Idle, yeah. Eric Idle, yeah. We, uh, this is, I don't know how long we got. Rutland Weekend Television was a BBC Two cheap television joke because Rutland is the smallest county in England. Anyway, it's a license to make cheap movies. And I thought one cheap thing was to do a black and white speeded up movie like A Hard Day's Night. Mm. 
um, because it's you put four guys in wigs and trousers and pointed shoes run around a field, you know what 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 can go wrong? <laughs> so uh, they, they they played this as part of the you know the the running gag. Yeah. Uh, that you know, the, okay. So Eric Idle's hosting the show because he said he could get the Beatles back together, but it was a bad line. It, it, what he'd said was the Ruttles, so they showed the Ruttles on Saturday Night Live, and the mailbag was amazing, and everyone was in on the joke, as it were. Mm -hmm. And so Lorne went downstairs and got the money, and that's how the film came about. All you need is cash. And I have to say <laughs> that George was right in it, you know, up to his neck, you right. know, because he really, really wanted to make that movie. Well, did you, did you feel, in the beginning, did you feel like you had to run it by the Beatles somehow? Or? No, because, I mean, one of them was sort of was like shoving us. <laughs> <laughs> so George was behind it all the way. Yeah, very much. He got Mick Jagger and uh, Paul Simon to come in there and lie through their teeth. You know, to, it's the same stories, but, uh, you know, just changing the names. It, it was, everybody knew what to do on that project. It was mm -hmm. fun. Because I think the timing for that was right. But, you know, why we're here tonight is because it is one of the major events of the 20th century. Yeah. You know, along with two world wars, the atom bomb, yeah. and a bit of Frank Sinatra <laughs> and Elvis. But, you know, the... <laughs> it pretty much sums it up. <laughs> how would you, I mean, how would you ultimately describe... I mean, the Beatles' influence did extend beyond just music, obviously. It is... True, what you say, Julie. The, the bear, I, I, I was told, you know, somewhere a difference between Tchaikovsky and Bach. You know, Tchaikovsky is all about the arrangement, mm -hmm. the orchestration. Whereas Bach, you know, you can play it on recorders, it sounds good. Mm -hmm. And you're right about the composition of those songs. You know, one of the most infuriating things as a composer is that they had to keep it elegant and yet simple. And, that, and they, they did that, you know, and it didn't sound overworked. They just worked out, you know, by playing all these other standards. I mean, they, they learned from everybody else as well, but they, yes. somehow the chemistry came up with what it was. And it had that effect at that time. Everyone must have been ready for it. You know, maybe just that right period of a generation growing up that their parents had been through a world war and they, wanted to, they felt they could change something. And that all that kind of, you know, any war, everyone says never again, you know, right. immediately. And morality raises its head again, you know, and they all have a, a hope for the future. Mm -hmm. and, and this wave, you know, the Beatles caught it. I think Derek Taylor had the best uh, explanation of that. He said, you know, people said the Beatles caught the bus. He said, no, the Beatles were the, the bus. bus. <laughs> <laughs> but they were very receptive to influences and inspirations. Yeah. Incredibly receptive. Yeah. So we, we, it's been called the British invasion, but it's really the African-American invasion to Britain coming back to America. Right. Because their, their openness and appreciation for black music, black American music, yep. uh, Little and Richard. Great influence and, and Motown, which is Muddy sponsoring Waters, this night. Yeah. yeah, all of that. So they, they, were, they, were, they were just sponges. And then it goes through their talent and comes out fresh and new. But what is so astounding, and this is what made it really phenomenally, not easy, but made it possible to create a film with almost no dialogue, with 33 Beatles songs telling the whole story, is that, that their seven years we compressed into two or three years of, of story time. But the change, the evolution of their music they were the bus, but they were also on the bus because yeah. the times, you can't separate when you're talking about no. even, you can't really separate the war. It's not that they were political in a, that that was the first thing, but you couldn't avoid the fact that the Vietnam War was right. going on, that protest was going on. So their innocence changed with the rest of the world. And they were at the vanguard of expressing it through music in mm. a very direct way without a lot of forethought but just extremely deep. How do you go from I want to hold your hand to a day in the life? Yeah. You know? I, I, I think partly, you know, the girls, you know, being what, channeled, yeah. um, the screaming yeah. forced them off the road. And That's an interesting another point. Studio. Into the studio Absolutely. where they got inventive with four track machines, put four of them together and made Sergeant Pepper. Mm -hmm. You know, because what are you, you going to do? Where are you going to put that energy? And they put it into recording. And, and in a way, they're to blame for all this progressive rock. <laughs> <laughs> but they used the orchestra, yeah. even yeah. backwards, you yeah. know, and George Martin and all his contribution. It's, it's that they didn't stop. 
they kept going and creating. It was something that is really um, admirable and something that all artists is, uh, want to do, is well, not to get stuck in one sound and yeah, in one uh, way. Some, yeah. Somebody made the point recently, I thought it was very interesting, that, that Elvis sort of ended up being blocked by his own celebrity and lived in it. The Beatles always seemed to be kind of trying to outrun it and to trying to find something new and different that took them beyond it. And which is why, you know, 40 years after they created all this stuff, you can make a movie based solely around Beatles music. Mm -hmm. Julie Taymor, Neil Innes, thank you both. Thank Neil, you. I think you're gonna, are you gonna sing us out here with the, this section? All right, I think so. We need a guitar, gents. <laughs> here we go. Neil is gonna play a little Ruddles tune for us. Well. Should I move? Uh, yeah, I think that's. Oh, that's not the one. Oh, never mind. It'll do. <laughs> What are you going to be playing, Neil? Well, because of the date, really, this song stuck up its hand. Um, it's a thing called Back in 64. Yeah. <laughs> Many years from now, when your grandchildren climb upon your knee, you may be quite astonished to see how many channels they can change on TV When some old film in black and white Comes on and there you are upon the screen Or is it someone just like someone you've been Looking not today over 19 Granddad the little ones are asking you Why do you look so sad? So you tell them all about the fun you had Back in 64, before you were born People had no time for pouring scorn On dreams of love and peace no one was obese, only tight trousers were worn. Back in 64, we were at it like knives. <coughs> Back in 64, the time of our lives was in the present tense. Now does that make common sense any more than girls with hairdos called behind? All together now, back in 64, before you were born. Back in 64, before you were born. But as you've gone on and on, your audience has flown. And as you find yourself all on your own, you may wistfully recall how Benjamin Disraeli said that life is too short to be small or maybe like some old time song overall it's long so so long it's all over To continue the conversation about the musical influences the, of the Beatles, we have four really great guests. First, Nile Rodgers, who just won three Grammy Awards for co-writing Get Lucky with Daft Punk. He is, of course, one of the great producers in music and the founder of the group Chic. John Oates, who is one half of the most successful duo in rock and roll history, Hall & Oates, who is about to be inducted into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. Felix Cavalieri of The Rascals who performed on this stage four times in the 60s and uh, who is already in the Rock and Roll role of Hall of Fame. And finally, Ted Kubler with the great indie rock band out of Brooklyn called The Hold Steady. Welcome to our four next guests. Niall, let me start with you. First of all, congratulations on three Grammy Awards long overdue. <laughs> Thank you. What a year. 
Um, can you talk about, I mean, talk about, I mean, you guys, between you, basically represent music from the 60s, 70s, 80s, 90s, and beyond. Um, so you stretch the whole thing. I mean, how much of an influence do the Beatles still have today? Um, still today, um, I think that uh, they changed the entire paradigm. I mean, prior to the Beatles, most artists um, were getting their songs from the Brill Building and yep. songwriters and stuff like that. Uh, after the Beatles came on the scene, uh, it changed all, the way that we all thought. I mean, we had to write our own music, thank God. Um, yeah. Changed my life because I get to write all my own stuff and get my own publishing and make a lot of money. But <laughs> <laughs> no, but it also artistically it changed the paradigm. In other words, if you weren't that, you weren't a relevant artist. So it it right. um, it sort of was a seismic shift in the way that we all dealt with music. They changed it both in terms of writing and also what you what you did in the recording studio, didn't they, John? I, I think one of you know for me personally, the the recording studio techniques that they developed have t totally revolutionize the way people make records and to this day I think every producer anyone who's making records owes a debt of gratitude to the Beatles and George Martin in particular because what they did and the way they approached making records totally changed everything um, and still the things that they pioneered on analog tape uh, really transferred in today's digital world and uh, people reference their production techniques constantly mm -hmm. Felix, I, I had conversations recently with, with uh, David Crosby, and uh, we, we, we talked to Billy Joel and Steve Van Sant, all of whom said, this night, February 9th, 1964, literally changed their lives. I mean, I think there were so many people who decided they wanted to be, have a musical career on this night 50 years ago. Where were you at that time? <laughs> <laughs> Where were you? Uh, well, you know, I, I worked with them in, in Europe prior to them coming to the States. You had? So I was kind of like aware, if you want to say. I mean, I, I thought I heard a little music with all the screaming, you know, when they were on stage. <laughs> and, and I looked at them very interesting. I said, what the heck? What is, what's going on here? You know what I mean? Like, you know, and I said this before, like when we heard them, when I heard them, I said, when they're playing our music, you know, collectively I'm talking about, you know, American R&B, they were okay. But when they did their music, there was this magic in the air. It was like, what is that? You know, it was like, you know, these, the way they were doing their chord structures and their timing was like, it didn't, didn't make any sense. Dun, 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 dun. But, you know, that night just re reinforced the fact that, yeah, I could do this. I'd like to do this. I think all of us would like to do this. Mm -hmm. You know, because they were a band. Right. They were a band. You ended up with a, a manager who had a big role in the Beatles, That's Sid right. Bernstein who uh, had a big role in getting them into Carnegie Hall on the first trip here, and then later, of course... Shea Stadium. Shea Stadium. And, and you had a small role at Shea Stadium, because Sid was promoting you then, wasn't he? <laughs> <laughs> we were in the dugout, you know, and, and here's like 50,000 people. I mean, just going wild. And all of a sudden, on this scoreboard over here, you see the rascals are coming. The rascals the are coming. The rascals are coming. <laughs> and Brian Epstein is going... Very nice. If that's not off in approximately eight seconds, there's be no show. <laughs> <laughs> so Sid was trying to light a little fire under you guys. The fire under everybody, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Tad, are the Beatles still relevant today to, to young indie bands? Uh, well, absolutely. I think, um, as John was saying, too, technologically, anybody who goes into a recording studio, you know, whether it's with three tracks or four tracks, or eight tracks, or now you can do 126 tracks if you want to. Right. Um, you still go back to those records, and and I think they had an enormous impact on anybody that wanted to record music, regardless of what the technology is, because a lot of that, a lot of what they did never changes, regardless of how it's archived, whether it's analog or digital. Um, and also the one thing that. I think really resonates with the Beatles is that they were a band. You know, yeah. before it wasn't just somebody like Eddie Cochran or, or, you know, somebody that was basically the main focus and then had a band that would come out with them. They worked together and they were really, they were like a gang. And I think that was kind of an important part of, of anybody who plays in a band. You realize, you know, they looked cool. There were four of them. Um, they all kind of looked the same. They had this look, and they were very unified. 
Uh, and well, I it, think was, that's, it was interesting because I mean they wore the same clothes, so in that sense, and that the same haircuts, so they looked the same. But they were all very, they were all distinctive. They each oh. had their own personality. So they had the sort of the the uniforms tied them together in the beginning. Right. But the personalities. Separated. Yeah, and anybody who's ever been in a band knows that there's always a lot of different personalities to deal <laughs> with. And, um, and that was the thing about, you know, uh, I think in doing a lot of research as you start to grow as a songwriter and you start to go through all the, the books and the biographies and the relationship between John Lennon and Paul McCartney is, uh, I think, still very much a template or a paradigm for any songwriting team. Right. Just as much as the band itself became sort of the archetype for what a rock and roll band was mm -hmm. supposed to be, right now? Absolutely. Um, I think Julie hit on something that was really important. Um, you know, when you think about the uniformity of it, mm -hmm. um, in R&B music, especially at Motown and things like that, if you notice, you go back and you look at the Temptations and bands like that, and the Miracles, they all dress the same. Yeah. The Beatles were the first sort of white rock and roll band that was right. doing that same thing that R&B bands did. And, and it shows that, that uh, it was a very successful formula when you bring back something that's familiar. It's already here, but we don't know how great it is until somebody else shows us how great it is. Right. John, what, what, one thing that's, I mean, you mentioned the Motown influence, and there was clearly, it, 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 the Beatles clearly took a lot from people like Smokey Robinson. I mean, what do you hear when you, when you hear the Beatles music in that, from that early period particularly? Well, you know, I had an interesting perspective on the early Beatles music because growing up outside of Philadelphia, there was actual backlash on Philadelphia radio about the Beatles oh, when they first came out. Wh why? Uh, they didn't want to play the Beatles songs because you couldn't dance to it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, in the small-minded world of Philadelphia, mm -hmm. bandstand kind of mentality, you couldn't dance to it. Uh, how wrong they were, needless <laughs> to say. But, um, and at first I thought, you know, I was, I was trying to listen to things like, as Niall said, Motown and, and string arrangements and horn arrangements. So I was, you know, as a young musician, that's, that was where my direction was. So to me, the Beatles sounded like a really rough kind of, a lot of rough edges, just this raw energy. And, I, and it didn't really appeal to me at first. It wasn't until uh, later on when they got into you know, Norwegian Wood and, and, the, and, and more of the experimental music, I started to really understand more what they were all about. Mm -hmm. Felix, what, what did you hear in the beginning? You, I mean, you talked, about, you, you, you talked about just the raw energy of it, but I mean, did they have an influence on the Rascals? Oh, yeah, of course. They had a, it's impossible to be in the business without having an influence from these guys. Mm -hmm. You know, number one, for example, the radio stations, they didn't want to play anybody's records. They had to play the Beatles. So when they laid something down, we could all do that now. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's no way we could have done How Can I Be Sure without Michelle or Yesterday. Nobody would have ever heard it. Mm -hmm. So they, they opened these doors. Every time they put a record out, they opened a new door. Mm -hmm. Whether they knew that or not, I don't know. But I mean, what can you say about it except for thank you? Mm -hmm. Amazing. Mm -hmm. it, it's when you look at... I mean, in so many ways, they became, they became a paradigm. We were talking about this in, in terms of both in terms of personality, in terms of music. And, and then the, one of the things that's so striking is, and John, you sort of alluded to this, was how much they changed and how quickly they changed. I, I, it's, I think it's amazing to think that they, they created this entire body of work in six and a half years or seven years. Basically, yeah. That's, that's, uh, that, I don't understand that. Uh, well, well, actually, I, I do. Yeah, you. <laughs> but, um, That's what we do. <laughs> but, but really, they're, they're, they were so prolific and so profound in what they, they did. And, and here again, I'll go back to the studio work. Um, just, the, just the things, their open-mindedness, and I think George Martin had a lot to do with this. I think his, his classical background and his background as a pure musician uh, gave them a foundation, allowed them to do things. Whatever they could dream up, he would help them articulate. And I think that's really a huge, uh, a huge um, con contribution to what they did, allowing them to make these in incredible uh, creative moves that they made. Yeah, I mean, I think they wrote somewhere around 200 songs in those six and a half years. And, and I said to the, somebody the other day, I think we all could probably hum about half of them. Exactly. You know, I mean, it's, it's an astounding... I mean, in terms of songwriting output, I mean, you've all been there. How extraordinary is what they did? It's beyond. <laughs> well, I mean, have you been... 
to a McCartney concert? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> I know. After the first 15 minutes, you go, I surrender. <laughs> <laughs> Are you kidding me? And after I three mean, and a half hours, you go, gosh. and then he didn't play this. <laughs> yeah, right, right. <laughs> Happen, you know, too often in, in, yeah. in our lifetime. I mean, he's, he's an unbelievable genius of, of songwriting, and, and John as well. And, if, and they had a third guy writing just to make it even better. I know. Amazing. Best, best third best writer on yeah, a, on a mean, band I ever. I recently <laughs> saw Roberta Flack concert, and she highlights all George Harrison stuff. Right. Yeah. So man, like you know, three in a group, you know. So that's why that, that's why we're here. Peter, I want to bring you back in for a second because you, I mean, you, you were a witness to so much of this. Why do you think the Beatles were so successful at changing as rapidly as they did? Well, they were very adventurous. They, they, you know, they, when they thought of something, they tried it straight away, and, and, uh, which was hard to do then. I mean, in the studio particularly, the studios were very regulated. Men in white coats came and set your compressor where it was supposed to be. Yeah. And until you had the power of the Beatles to walk up to a Fairchild and turn the knob all the way just to see what happens, and it didn't blow up, and it sounded fantastic. <laughs> so they realized that they should ignore the rules and do whatever they wanted. And they, they, that applied to the studio and to their musical development in general. But why do you think they had the courage, if you will, to do that when so few people were? Um, it's a very good question. It was part of their nature. They had this working class, you know, sort of cheeky, we can try anything attitude, you know, because uh, up till then, nobody expected anything serious in Britain to come out of youth. No one expected anything serious to come out of the working class. Right. Or the north of England which all of us in London look down on. Geographically impossible, but you know what I mean. And <laughs> so, I mean, they, they broke so many barriers that suddenly, I mean, important things were supposed to be done by upper-class, middle-aged, proper grown-ups in London. Right. And suddenly, these people had the nerve, and you're right, they had a huge amount of nerve to just, to, to recognize their own self-importance and try stuff and break rules, so socially, as well as uh, in the studio. Mm -hmm. are they got the, away with it all. Are we on the internet or are we on it's network science. television? Internet. <laughs> well, once you start smoking pot and taking acid, are you kidding me? <laughs> <laughs> are you kidding? <laughs> Thanks for checking first, though, John. And, and, then, and then they give you a recording studio? Right. <laughs> Everything blinks I'm and beats and flashes so and there's knobs and <laughs> these are great. <laughs> Neil, let me bring you back in for a second because what, I mean, one, of the, what, one of the, I mean, one of the things that Peter talked about is, I mean, is every, everybody coming from up north, which was, was one part of this. But so much of the music that came out of Britain came out of kids in, who were coming out of art school, essentially, which, which is, as I understand it, is basically where you went if you couldn't make it in regular school. Well, there's a little truth in that. I mean, I was an art student, and it's true. <laughs> Sorry, it, We are complete strangers to work. Um, no, but I think John went to art school. I, I, I tell you, I don't know whether this is true or not, because uh, when, you, when you sit down and draw something, you look at it very hard, and you, you learn to sort of really be observant. And I think this triggers off something in your brain that if you're also listening to something, you listen with as much vigor, if you like, or, or you know, precision. And so you can hear frequencies and you can do all these things and it becomes like drawing in another way. I don't, I don't want to sound pretentious, but I probably am. <laughs> but, uh, you know, it's, it, the art school thing is it, also, it was kind of part of that time was a, a, a chance of sort of saying, well, look, it's our chance now, we can do something different. And I think as a generation, we did feel we could yes. make a difference. Exactly. Mm -hmm. and, but and you had, I mean, you had, in addition to John Lennon, you had, I mean, in, in The Who, you had Pete Townsend, Townsend coming out yeah. of art school, you had Keith Richards coming out of art yeah, school. Yeah. It seemed like, I mean, every major British band had somebody coming out of, out of art school. I know, and they're all wonderfully articulate men. <laughs> No, I mean, whatever gifts people are given, it, 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 I, like, I like the jibe about, you know, art school is for people who are not going to become lawyers or doctors or rocket scientists. Right. But I think everybody should be valued for what they do in society generally, but that's just philosophy. <laughs> <laughs> Dad, did you want to say something? Oh, J Jimmy Page came out of art school right, as well. Right, another one, yeah. So, that's, I mean, it's, and you know, the, the relevance too that's funny, and Julie, said this much better than I'm going to be able to now, but with every generation, there's, 
you have a band that becomes, you know, kind of at the apex of, of popularity, and you find out what their influences were after you like them, and you work backwards. And it all goes back to, you know, like, I was in the bands like The Smiths and The Sex Pistols and, you know, grew up on punk rock, and then later, you know, came to, to you know, an ear earlier Led Zeppelin, and all that stuff leads back to American rhythm and blues and American blues music. Yeah. Um, but it kind of goes back and forth to England and then to America, and then, you know, and it happens generation after generation after generation. Mm -hmm. Are we going to be having this conversation in another 50 years, do you think? Yes, yes. absolutely. We are. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, if, if medical science will allow. <laughs> <laughs> My thoughts exactly. All right, Julie, go ahead. When I was working on the film on Across the Universe, of course, I looked at A Hard Day's Night or as much of the visual material as well, and they did the first music videos. That's the other thing. Yes. That yeah. So the connection with the visual, the fashion, the change in fashion, you know, t we were talking uh, uh, earlier about the fact that there was a major war that was so much a part of youth culture, mm -hmm. pro the protest, that they had to change with the times. Uh, this, this, just look at what was going on between 1962 or 63 and 1968 or 1969. Look at the, the culture in not just Great Britain and in America, but across the universe, across the world, and what was going on with the protest and the power of youth to make a difference. I think they were at the beginning. Absolutely. So therefore, they were young, naive, and open. They didn't have a plan. But once they got on the airplane and went, they flew. And so they were so receptive, you know, not just to the past, but to the present they were living in, the drugs, the whatever, the, the you know, how do you get um, a revolution, the songs that, that were created. I don't think that they started that way. They, they woke up and said, I'm so tired, and went back to sleep again. You know, every single waking moment was fodder for material, and that is fabulous. That is what is so great. Well, you talk about, I mean, you talk about them essentially making their first music videos. I mean, in, in so many ways, A Hard Day's Night is still like the template for every rock and Everything. roll Everything. Handheld video. camera. Yeah. Ad nauseum. Yeah. Right. You know, right. it's like, it's, um, it's, um, yeah, I mean, and, and Neil, are we still hearing them in, in, in humor, do you think? In, in humor, I'm, I'm sorry, I didn't quite get the question. Well, in, in, terms of, in terms of that first press conference that they had in, in, at, uh, at, uh, at Kennedy Airport. Oh, right, yeah. You know, which, which is, is still one of the funniest things I've ever seen. You know, and you can go back and watch it now. It still resonates. It's still funny. It's still quick. It still seems, it seems fresh. I mean, is... is John, John had the sharpest quickest mind, I think, and the others rolled along with it, mm -hmm. you know, and, and I, I think there was a clip you showed earlier on where said, well, explain what the name Beatles means, you know. Well, it's just a name, like shoe. Yeah, we could have been the shoes, you know. I mean, <laughs> I just love it, you know, that's the yeah. way you go. I mean, and in fact, making the Ruttles was very similar to that, you know, we, we sort of copied that in a way. We thought, we'll go in the deep end, you know. I mean, in fact, and Eric said to me when I was in the bath being, he said, what are, you, what are you doing in the bath? And I, I had no script. I said, well, I'm in the bath getting wet because basically we want to demonstrate to the world that, you know, civilization is basically an effective sewage system. <laughs> and we hope to demonstrate this by the use of plumbing. You know, I mean, it's, a, it's just nonsense from the top of the head. But just John, when he did his bed-ins and all the rest of it, was actually you know, using comedy uh, to sort of make a very serious mm. point that, you know, he was trying to use the same techniques that advertising campaigns do to flog the idea of peace and love, you know. And, uh, yes, he, he, he stuck his head over the parapet and people were taking pot shots at him, but it was nevertheless a very courageous f and funny, serious, funny thing to do, mm -hmm. to sort of take on the received wisdom of the times in a way, and sort of how we're all sucked into sort of the message and the machine and all the other jargon and buzzwords for it. But at the bottom line is that everybody is alone in this life and we're all alone together. Mm -hmm. And when he start talking about, you know, well, actually, if we were nice to each other, how about trying that for a while? <laughs> it's not a bad idea. Wasn't the humor? Oh, sorry. Yeah. <laughs> no, go ahead. 
I think, Peter, maybe you can answer this, but wasn't the humor also Liverpoolian, if that is the right word? Isn't, the, isn't it part of... I suppose I'm, I'm, I don't know. I actually was not in Liverpool but, much, but, but I'm, I would imagine. We were all, of course, influenced by The Goon Show and all the stuff, all the things we were listening to. It all goes back to Spike Milligan for us. But I think it would go back to, actually, back to Charlie Chaplin and the Marx Brothers. I mean, that was yes, a huge part of yes. that. Yes, of course. You know, they were stupid. I mean, yeah, we, we loved humor. American yeah. humor as well. But, but I don't know if it's particularly But I meant the dry, it might the, be. The, the humor, the, the dry dryness humor of it, maybe of, in of, more, more than things. I do Liverpool think so. Liverpool is known so. for yes. yeah. sense of humor. Yes. All the comedians yeah. come from Liverpool. So that's that's that true. kind of that's simple, true. quick answer. Yeah. That yeah. Yeah. Yes, Patty, yeah, that's yeah. something you said you were, you were particularly charmed by with George. Because it was so foreign to me. It was so unusual. And... Um, it just made me laugh. I thought that they were absolutely hilarious. Obviously, there were the odd words I didn't understand because they're purely <laughs> from Liverpool. Like what? Oh, ah. Uh. Jam butty. <laughs> yes, well, jam butty. <laughs> Which would be what? A jam sandwich. <laughs> Slathered with butter. Yeah. They had uh, so many different expressions, but I mean, ultimately, they were just very, very witty and amusing and fast. Yes. Now, when I think about sort of two, I think of sort of 64, 65 as there being like two musical forces converging on America. And one was the Beatles that came from England and the other one was Motown. Absolutely. Is that, is that, is that right? No, for, for my world, um, that's exactly right. Uh, I remember that Beatles broadcast like it was yesterday. Um, I had never heard of the Beatles prior to that Ed Sullivan show. And there was a girl in my wow, elementary school, <laughs> and she said, she said that we had to go watch this. She was really cute, mm -hmm. and if a cute girl says you have to do something, you do it. You wanted to have something to talk about you the next day. It. So I remember going to her house with her, and, um, and uh, this was right at, you know, it was, anyway. I remember going to her house with her, and she's screaming at the television set. <laughs> And I'm sitting there trying to count. Now, remember, this is a bright, bright girl. She was very, very... When we were 11, you remember back... Well, you're, we're sort of in the same age group. We used to be smart at 11 years old. Really, really smart. So I'm looking at this girl who's bright. She's one of the brightest kids in my school. And she's screaming at the television set. And I'm looking at her going, OK, what's going on here? Like, there's, is there something happening that I'm not involved in? Um, and, and I'm watching her scream at the, at the television set, and of course I'm sucking this in. Right. And I'm trying to figure out what's going on, because when they were singing the song, it was cool. I, I, it had not hit black radio, at least not in law. At this time, I was living in L.A. And, um, and I didn't quite get it, and I certainly didn't understand the screaming part. I really did not get that. <laughs> exactly but right. then after it was over, she explained the whole experience to me intellectually. What did she say? She, well, she broke it down, and she says... Well, do you know, Niall, that we're on the uh, threshold... I'm, I'm paraphrasing, but it was something like this. She says, you know, <laughs> Niall, uh, we're on the... And she was putting on a faux English accent, like somewhere in... <laughs> in no, seriously. Seriously, we're like... We, live in, we were living in the ghetto in the serious... <laughs> <laughs> we're living in a serious hood in L.A., and she puts on this faux English accent, and she says, well, you know, now, we're actually on the threshold of something very important happening musically. And up until this time, I had very been cool. it, totally a classical musician. Right. It's a true story. I had never played pop music in my life, even though I loved jazz, I was brought up on it, but I only played symphonic music, whatever we were playing in the school orchestra. Mm -hmm. And I listened to this girl when she said that we were on the threshold of something important. And this is a true story. The very first song I ever learned to play in my life on guitar was the Beatles song, A Day in the Life. Wow. It happened about five years later because I still played nothing but classical music until I picked up the guitar at 16. Right. But when I picked up the guitar, the first song I learned, man, I was trying hard to get it right. Why did you pick that song? Um, because I, I loved it. At that point, um, you read my book. Yes, I did. <laughs> so, so but I'm trying to get them to hear uh, it. All right, well, okay. So John brought up a very important point uh, here. Um, I'm not condoning this or saying that, you know. So, <laughs> you know, put your ears in your, put your fingers in your ears. But I met this gentleman named Timothy Leary. Oh my God. <laughs> yes, 
Yes, sir. When, I, when I was around 14 and a half years old, LSD was not illegal, by the way. So we were not doing illegal drugs. But anyway, one day uh, during uh, uh, this... Anyway, I met Timothy Leary. Uh, the first record that changed my world was The Doors' first album. And then after The Doors, I, I went home uh, two days later. <clears throat> yeah. uh, I was, com I was completely, completely disheveled when I left my house. I, I always laugh at this. I used to look like a pimp in training, because that's how we used to dress in those days. We idolized the temptations. We idolized the miracles. So when we were going out for a day on the town, we were going out roller skating, we dressed in shark skin suits, white shoes. The white shoes are still here. Um, white Italian shoes. We used to call them Italians. And, uh, and I ran into Timothy Leary and these guys, blah, 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 and I listened to The Doors, and I listened to The Trogs and them and all of that stuff, and I came home. Total, I was totally into nothing but Motown when I left. When I came home, I was into everything. And I remembered what that girl had said, that we were on the threshold of general you know, and, and when I picked up the guitar, so now the Beatles were the Beatles at this point. They're, right. they're happening and so and so. So I'm listening to this other music. So I figured, well, if I'm going to jump into this pool, I'm going to jump into the deep end. I yeah. jump into the Beatles right away. And I didn't realize how hard playing a day in the life is if it's your very first song on guitar. Well, fortunately, I had been a music reader and a music student all my life. So I'm looking at the sheet music, struggling through this thing. And then finally, my mom's boyfriend at the time comes in and retunes my guitar because I had it out of tune. Mm -hmm. And I hit that first G chord. Uh -huh. And I swear to you, I felt like <laughs> Sir Edmund Hillary. Oh. I hit that chord <laughs> and I went, and it was it. And then I followed by a B minor, and I boom, I went, and really slowly I went, boom, and I've had the faux English accent. <laughs> I read the news today, oh boy. <laughs> boom, boom, ba boom, ba boom, ba boom. <laughs> And, and the rest, as they say, is history. Three years later, I was gigging in Sesame Street, the Apollo Theater, blah, 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 blah. Five years after that, I wrote my first hit record, and so on, so on, so on. Now I'm here with you. Double size. Oh, totally. Yeah. <laughs> as the Chambers brothers would say, my soul. Like, Felix, one last thing here. You actually, you played this stage, ended up playing this stage four times, right? Yeah. What was it like to be on the Ed Sullivan Show? Uh, insane. Yeah? <laughs> See, we'd start on a Monday morning about 7 a.m., get up here, and... Uh, the ladies here whose father was the, Bob Precht, I think was his name. Yep. He get us into gear real quick, and you know, we sat around and waited, and we rehearsed, and we did it Tuesday, then we did it Wednesday, then we did it Thursday, then we did it Friday, then we did a full dress rehearsal Sunday, a Saturday night. Wow. And then Sunday night came, and it was over in two and a half minutes. <laughs> 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 so, you know, when you're used to rocking, you just got your volume on two and a half months. You just started, right. you know? So we would go home, and I was living with my, my ex-partner there, Brigatti, Eddie. He'd come home and wreck our apartment. Had all that energy, all built up, two right. and a half minutes, you know, that's it. Right. But it was, it was live, and it was live, and, and as you said, when you fr first came out, they, 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 he, he would see somebody in the audience, and he'd just stop, and there goes your whole time budget. Right. Because now you maybe have two minutes and ten seconds. They adjust it on the fly? <laughs> it was on the fly. Wow. So it was, it was pretty wild, you know. But what did it mean to be on that show? Well, you know, it, it meant a lot of people were going to see you and, 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 you know, like a lot of people were going to tell you it didn't sound that great. <laughs> you know? It was a very big deal for us because we hadn't heard of many American television shows. Right. You know, we didn't get them in England. And Ed Sullivan was one that was famous enough that we actually knew about it. You know, we'd never seen it. Right. But we knew that when you got to us be on the Ed Sullivan Show, that was a very big deal. Huh. So we were very excited about it. Did it and it was your when, you, when, when he was there, it was all very much, you know, Mr. Sullivan. And right. It was back in the age of respect, you know. Yeah. And, <laughs> <laughs> you know, and uh, it wasn't Dave like Dave Letterman, it was Mr. <laughs> Sullivan. But, and it was fun, it was exciting to do. Always exciting. That was before the Beatles and Timothy Leary. <laughs> That's right, exactly, it was. <laughs> was it big for your record sales, Peter? I think so. Uh, I'm sure it was, yes, because I, I mean, World Without Love went to number one, and so, so uh, yes, I mean, it was, it was a big deal for us. Felix, for you guys, was it? Yeah, yeah, tremendous help.
Yeah. Yeah, because, you know, remember, in those days, if you were touring, that's a lot of touring to get the whole United States in. Yeah, you got it's huge. in one, one, you know, two minute slot. Yeah. Yeah, one of the big changes, of course, from England was regional hits, you know, and Sullivan was national. But unlike England, where your record's either a hit or it's not, it's on the BBC or it's not. Right. That's it. Or yeah. Radio Luxembourg. Right. But here, you know, we rapidly discovered you could be huge in LA and then Cleveland, they'd never heard of you. Right. You know, but once you were on Sullivan, the whole country had the option of seeing you at the same time, and that right. made a big difference. All right. Nile Rogers, John Oates, Felix Cavalieri, Tad Kubler, Peter Asher, <laughs> Patty Boy, <laughs> Mick Jones, Julie, thank you, Tamor, <laughs> Neil Innes. Thank you all for being here tonight. Many years from now, when your grandchildren climb upon your knees, you may be quite astonished to see How many channels they can change on TV When some old film in black and white Comes on and there you are upon the screen Or is it someone just like someone you see Looking not today over 19 Granddad, the little ones are asking you, why do you look so sad? So you tell them all about the fun you have.